as a Christian. And I think that relates to the presentation of the gospel, right? That's kind of where we're headed, this life-giving message that we've received, that we are to take. Um, but I think it also relates to relationships, interacting with other people in a lot of different ways, and I would include within that social engagements. And some of you may have noticed that I spent a lot more time socially engaged this week than I maybe ever have in my life. Um, and I'm hoping you'll hold me accountable to, um, hopefully that'll be more than the rest of my pastoral ministry combined, hopefully. Um, it's been a really long, uh, tough week for many, but maybe the least uh, for me. Um, some of you may not know, but there was a horrific uh, picture of our Baraboo boys taken last um, May, and uh, that got spread out and made viral news and, and had quite um, a reaction around the world and portraying both our boys and our uh, community. And I engaged that, and I guess I want to maybe say two things about that just related to me engaging it. One, I realize that I'm finding my voice as a senior pastor. It's kind of strange, but I might have engaged it just the same way, but I recognize it's taken differently. It's something I'm having to learn and grow into, being the senior pastor. People in the community are treating it differently um, in the way that I that I speak. And so I guess I'd encourage you to have some patience with me as I figure out how I share my voice. I'm two and a half months in. And if you think two and a half months, that's not very long. That's basically the infant nursery <laughs> of becoming a senior pastor. Um, and I think I'd also like to say that I would like to have at times my own voice. And I hope I still have one. And I don't know... Um, if that's entirely true or not. Um, I realize at times I speak for us, and I hope when I do that it's very clear that I'm speaking for us and for the church. Um, and I know I always speak for Christ, right? But in areas of wisdom and in justice, there are times where we have differences of opinion. And I know some of you have differences of opinion from me, even on my handling of uh, this situation. And I want you to know that I'd like at times to have my voice still, and I hope that you're comfortable having your voices and that your voices can be different than mine. Did that somehow make sense? I said a lot of things in a little loop there. Um, I'll be honest, I kind of hate it when people speak for me. Anybody else feel like that? When you've said something and then later somebody else declares what that meant, and what it was all about. I hear somebody say, well, I know Dan, Dan said this, and he meant that. I mean, on, on anything complicated, I just like being very nuanced, and even then I liked it, or have to sometimes correct myself or make changes. Um, but I hate it when people speak for me, and maybe you feel that way too. Um, and just think about how crazy it is that God has us speak for him. I'll be honest, I think that's unbelievable. I think it's amazing. It's wonderful. It's a huge responsibility. But I also kind of think that must be exceptionally irritating to him. Um, and sometimes when I say things, I wonder if he's not thinking, that is not what I meant. Or you're making a way bigger deal of it. I really do wonder sometimes in the confidence with which I uh, preach things. But we serve an amazing God who does allow us at times to even speak uh, for himself. Um, well, as I was engaging uh, the picture controversy this week, um, there was a rather uh, pushy older woman in the church that said to me, I was hoping that it wouldn't be too much a part of the message for this week. And I said, no, mom. No, <laughs> mom. We plan to keep, oh boy. <laughs> you can bring your head back up, Mom. <laughs> no, I very much intend to continue with our series and preaching. This is a very important um, message and transition that we're making. It's 
the week where we look at the fact that God has, in fact, called us to speak for him. So week one was he has spoken. Week two, it is written. So week one was all about um, God does speak. He reveals his will and his ways. And what a precious gift. He wrote it down for us. We don't have to wonder. We don't have to just have open-ended prayers and kind of listen for things. And, oh, I think he wants me to do this. Or, oh, I think he... He speaks to us in, in some of the most profound ways, his will and his ways, and he's written them down uh, for us. He's written much for us to understand. We looked at even the way Jesus saw the Bible, and I hope we as a church see the Bible the way that Jesus and the way that the scriptures uh, speak of the Bible. And then we're going to turn a corner, and we're going to now start to take that message and to, de- and to declare it. And there's a couple ways we're going to do that. Um, One is through the function of preaching, and this is um, very exciting, and that's going to be today's message, at least it is for me, and then um, week four next week will be in a more broad sense. We are all called to go and be witnesses uh, for him. So this is that amazing transition where God decides that he's going to use us, broken vessels, warped vessels, some more than others, some more than others. Um, but he uses us to declare his words. And we're going to be in 2 Timothy 4, if you want to use your Bibles. Second Timothy 4. Verses 1 to 5. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Well, again, okay, this is 2 Timothy chapter 4, and it was last week that we looked at 2 Timothy chapter 3, and as I mentioned talking to the kids, um, Paul is concerned with the times. He refers to them in the last days, there will come times of difficulties, and he lays out what it's going to look like. Look at this list. So this is the beginning of 2 Timothy chapter 3. People will be lovers of self. There are so many, there are so many words and concepts here. It's going to be tough to soak them all in just by con- way of context here. Think about this. People will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And listen to the end of this. Having an appearance of godliness, but denying its power. Very interesting what Paul says here. He depicts a horrific scene and describes them as the last days. You feel like we're in the last days? I think so. And this, in many ways, could fit any one of us on any particular day. And yet this last description, having the appearance of godliness, is quite a bite. But denying its power. I don't want to try to figure that out too hard, but I wondered about that. Denying the power of godliness, or is it by our behavior we seem to deny its power in our lives or its effect into our lives. And then what he says about people that are in 
this situation. It's kind of interesting too. Avoid such people. I'm kind of surprised Paul said that. Sometimes in scriptures, we're encouraged to come alongside those who are covering any of those categories. But there are times where you need to back away and you need to create some space and distance. Well, Paul's solution again for Timothy is to chart a different course. Continue in what you have learned and firmly believed from childhood. You've been acquainted with the sacred writings. He's talking about the scriptures. And then we come now into chapter 4, and the call then is to preach the word. What Timothy needed in his battle with godlessness was to stay close to God's words. And God's words were important not only for him, his godlessness was important to avoid, but he was concerned about others as well. So you take those words and proclaim them to others. And in this case, expression is used here to Timothy, preach the word. I want to look a little bit at preaching the word. And we'll look at five characteristics of biblical preaching. Okay, five characteristics of biblical preaching. The first one, biblical preaching is from the Bible. Stop and think about that. Okay, kind of a slow start, right? Biblical preaching is from the Bible. Um, almost goes without saying, but let's not. Because sometimes preaching is done without the Bible. There are actually some churches, not picking on any one in particular, that might use the Bible or some reference in the Bible, but they might use another book or they might use um, a piece of poetry or some special uh, writings that have affected their lives. And they actually will, will preach from something other uh, than the biblical text. Well, when you come to hear preaching, you ought to want to hear more than a pastor talk about life, more than to hear a pastor talk about his own life or his own stories or other people's stories, you should expect that a pastor would open up the Word of God and preach from it. And Timothy, oh, let's see, there we go, um, shows that, I think, in a couple ways. Right there in verse 2, he says, preach the Word. What's the Word? The scriptures, right? The scriptures are the word of God. Preach the word. And then he says, when you preach the word, you're going to reprove. You're going to rebuke. You're going to exhort with complete patience and teaching. Well, that sounds a little like those words sound similar to what was said about the scriptures just a couple verses before that. All scriptures be out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Very similar words used here in chapter 4 in describing preaching, okay? So you engage the scriptures with these things, right? You engage the scriptures, and then he's calling Timothy in biblical preaching to turn around and do the same thing with the Bible. So it's bringing forth what the Bible does for you when you read it to other people. Okay, that one was a Kind of an obvious one. Well, let's look at the next one. This is all just from this passage. There's more that could be said about biblical preaching. Second characteristic of biblical preaching, biblical preaching is personally challenging. Did you hear the things that were said about preaching there? Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. So I'm going to take from that, that not only the exercise, we talked about that last week, the exercise of reading God's Word is going to be at times hard. These are hard things, and we live in a culture where people don't want to do hard things. And I've shared, I think, in other contexts, I don't think I mentioned last week, that that was kind of a battle that we had in our house through middle school. Um, middle schoolers, not always, just don't giggle too loud. Um, you know, sometimes you go through a little stage of life there where you really don't want to do anything hard. It's like, what's the easiest path? And that's not going to work when it comes to spending time in the Word. And biblical preaching is described much the same way. There are going to be hard things at times that you're going to hear 
in preaching. You're going to be challenged by the Word of God. And if a pastor is raising up the Word of God and speaking its truths to you, it's not going to be comfortable. Reproof is not comfortable. That's not a happy affirmation word. Rebuke. He's telling Timothy to rebuke people with the word. That can be dangerous. And exhort with complete patience and teaching. Did you know that I actually think about um, balancing three things when I preach? I think about this maybe not every week, but I try to, to balance three things that will hopefully help keep people's attention. Right, Carter? I'm just kidding. <laughs> You've maybe had a long week too. He's one of my wrestlers, so I can give him a hard time. I try to explain things. So I try to explain the text. I think in preaching you need explanation, and I try to illustrate. I try to bring it to life or think of things. If the point is made in the text, and I can explain it and show you it's there, then I'd like to explain it, but then also illustrate it. And hopefully, and sometimes that's even easier to hear. A little breathing takes place. Too much explanation in my manuscript, and I go, uh-oh, you know, that's boring. And I don't want people to disconnect, but I want them to think about the truth. So sometimes you explain, you illustrate. So explanation, illustration, and then exhortation. I mean, there should be some exhortation. I think that's part of what... Paul is calling Timothy to do. Now, some pastors, that's kind of all they do, and they're, they're kind of a hammer when they go at it. And Pastor Dave sometimes calls them screamers, you know, the ones that their pitch and their tone is almost monotone in an in a over-emphatic sort of way. There should be some beautiful moments in the Scripture and some hard moments in the Scripture. And, but when he's talking to Peter right here, he's saying, sometimes you've got to lay it on thick. In fact, I received a I received a number of gifts when I became a senior pastor in September, but a number of you did not give me a gift, and I just want to point that out too. <laughs> no. Um, but it was funny. I got um, a really nice gift. Don't zoom in. No, I'm just kidding. Um, and it's a really nice uh, framed uh, little thing that Mark Reese came up with. Mark, I don't know if you're here today. Um, but it was encouraging, and it had a couple Bible texts on it. And I received some other really neat things. The women's ministry um, gave me uh, a mighty fortress and just a beautiful uh, uh, picture frame. And here, he actually has 2 Timothy 4.2 there. It says, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. 2 Timothy 4.2, and then Mark uh, added his own little uh, thing, which he made much, much larger than the actual Bible verse, which says, bring it. <laughs> and what he was saying, and, and from talking to him, I think I can, can say this, what he was saying was, I want at times to be pushed. I want at times to be challenged. I want at times for you to say things that are hard, that I'm not necessarily in my nature or spirit wanting to receive, but they're said by God, and I, I need you to say them. Okay, maybe he didn't tell me all of that, but I think that's kind of where uh, Mark is going. And uh, of course, for a pastor starting his first couple weeks, that also might bring a little pressure, um, but Mark didn't understand that part of things. But um, he's calling us to, he's calling Timothy here, preach the word. Give them some hard stuff. It's important. And I like right at the end there, too, it says, with complete patience and teaching. It's going to be important for Timothy as he preaches hard things, maybe not to always expect absolute, immediate, decisive response, right? Sometimes it's hard, and hard things are a process. So, I mean, he says, with complete patience. What does that mean if not... They're a work in process, and you have to be loving and caring and explaining things. You're teaching, you're explaining, you're helping them understand, but you're also calling out hard things, okay? So biblical preaching um, is also personally challenged, uh, personally challenging. And then I take from this text, too, it's not always well-received, right? When you preach hard things... Sometimes it's not going to be 
well-received. And this is a kind of a famous section here where he says, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Now, how many of you, when I said in season and out of season, thought of deer hunting? <laughs> be honest. Probably those people aren't here this morning, right? Because <laughs> I believe we're in season right now. Am I right about that? Yeah, we just started, I think, gun season. Um, but there's something about being in season in preaching. There are times where you are going to preach things that are wonderful, and, and, and they resonate with people, and they resonate with the culture that you're in. There are many attributes and, and many characteristics and many principles in the scriptures that resonate with people today. And they like to hear those things. And he's, Timothy knows that. You know, he says, be ready. You're going to have to do this in season, but he says, but also out of season. There are going to be times when things are not well received by people and maybe even the very nature of preaching won't be well received. And that's hard, especially in a world that doesn't like hard words. I would say we live in that world right now, um, a world that's hypersensitive to being judged. Everybody today is very concerned when you bring up um, a more, any moral standard. They're very concerned to being judged, and they specifically don't like God's standard. Um, so that's where hard stuff comes into play, and there's going to be an out-of-season. And I hope at the end of the message to give a one example of such a season in the life of John Bunyan. Well, biblical preaching is from the Bible. It's personally challenged, not well-received. And then number four, along those same lines, it's spelled out a little more, it's difficult to endure. It's in season and out of season, and I like the way Paul says this, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. He's saying there's a point in time where people will not endure other translations say sound doctrine. Did you know that some teachings of the Bible have to be endured? <laughs> have you thought about that? Have you experienced that? I'll be honest, I sometimes have felt guilty when I've struggled with um, different doctrines in the Bible that are hard. Let's throw out a couple. What doctrines are personally hard for you to work through? Anybody want to throw one out? Let the dead be dead. Oh, boy. Okay, I have to think about that one. <laughs> Let the dead bury the dead? Oh, okay. Let the dead bury the dead. I was thinking, boy, he, he just pulled out a very obscure <laughs> passage over there. Okay, good. Yeah, kind of, you know, Jesus uh, identifying um, a relationship with him at times that will be um, at a challenge or, or at, uh, in conflict with your relationship with family. Okay? What's that? But he can save, say it. He can say it, but he can say it. But God has the right to say it. Okay, I'm going to start. That, that didn't work out so well. No, that was good, Easton. But <laughs> You got one, Terry? God hates divorce. You guys, this really is not working out well at all. <laughs> this is not really well. I was thinking somebody would say, like, hell. The doctrine of hell. Wasn't that more obvious? Yeah, that's, no, I'm sorry, Terry. Um, yeah. There are, and for me, when I think about the doctrine of hell, I mean, it's so troubling. It's so difficult. And when people say it's hard and difficult for them, I don't want to minimize that. I don't want to pretend like, well, you just have to believe it. Um, I do think you just have to believe it at the end. But he's saying that doctrines sometimes are difficult to endure. And he's saying they, they must. They have to endure them, but there are many, many things um, that are a challenge. And, and, and some people are going to walk away from the Scriptures, and some are going to hold fast. But if you struggle with some uh, points of Scripture or some teachings of the Christian faith, um, 
that's to be anticipated. Hell is difficult. I think for our culture, sin in general is difficult. Or again, God's standard. The sovereignty of God. Many people struggle with with God's sovereignty over all things and specifically over evil and evil acts. Why doesn't he do more? Um, I think some people struggle with even just the notion of a holy God and, and feeling like he's maybe uh, especially an angry sort. Or some it's the doctrine of election or male and female roles as described in the Bible. Or maybe it's the sexual ethic that's described in the scriptures. There are many points where you may have to struggle with holding on to what the scriptures describe. And Paul is saying biblical preaching um, calls people to endure. Uh, you have to work through those that do not uh, want to receive it. So there's a process, and it's interesting. When you want to leave Christian teaching, this is just an amazing process, and it's so sad. How many times have we seen this played out? The time is coming when people will not endure sound doctrine. So they won't endure, and instead they'll get itchy ears. They'll, they'll want to hear something different. So they don't like what they're hearing. And some translations refer to ears being tickled, or you hear, hear that expression. They'll all of a sudden want to hear something different. And they'll actually go looking for it. I don't like that doctrine. I don't like what it teaches. And they'll want to find others that can present something different for them, and then they actually accumulate for themselves teachers. You, you want to fortify, right? You know, I'm not going to endure. I'm getting itchy for something different, and then I'm going to find it, and I'm going to fortify, and I'm going to kind of build this, this army around me, and people do this all the time. And I'm just telling you, if you want to find something other than biblical Christianity, it's out there. And if you don't like something in the Bible, but you want to still be a biblical Christian, if you don't like something in the Bible, there is a teacher out there for every doctrine, every doctrine that you don't like. I don't know if I'm hopefully not creating a blueprint for you to, to do this, but um, there's a teacher that will reject every doctrine in the Christian faith, and you can always find, you can accumulate them and say, oh, well, I read, and then the way people are handling theology today is to say, well, this seems like a legitimate teacher. Well, I'm going to find other legitimate teachers that I like better. You like this legitimate one? Well, we found these other legitimate ones. And, well, they're all legitimate. And who's really to say? And they just create a fog over theology. And in creating that fog, they decide... I guess it doesn't matter which one I choose. And then you pick the one you prefer. An awful lot of theology is being handled this way today. They accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away. So now the imagery is not of fortifying, but okay, I didn't like, let's see, were the good teachers over, no, the good ones were over here. Um, so I don't like them. I'm, I think I went back and forth on that, didn't I? Um, I'm going to find other teachers and I'm going to fortify myself with those other teachers, and then I'm going to turn away from listening to the truth. I don't want to hear any more of the truth. I've got the teachers that I want, thank you, and they wander off into myths. Very sad picture. Quite a bit of detail of this process given by Paul in this especially short uh, passage. Well, I might point out, this is a fairly awful picture of biblical preaching. Would you agree? This is hard stuff. It's from the Bible. It's, it's personally challenging, not well received, going to be difficult to endure. Then why do it? Because it's desperately urgent. It's desperately urgent, and I take that from the very first bit before Paul even says, preach the word. Listen to the language here. He says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing 
and his kingdom preach the word. Now, why did he do all that buildup? <laughs> he's, he's saying, I charge you in the presence of God. He's kind of just taking you right into thinking about the very presence of God and of Christ Jesus. And what does he have to say about Jesus? Who is to judge the living and the dead. And by his appearing in his kingdom. He takes our minds and our hearts to eternity. Eternity is at stake, Timothy. These are important things. It's not just, well, it sure would be nice to have a speaker on Sunday morning. Sure would be nice to have somebody give a dress. I like the way he tells stories. This would be great. Paul is saying there's an urgency. I've created the function of preaching. That you would spend time in the Word, think it through, read it to people. Interpret what it means, explain it, and then exhort it to them. And that's going to be something special. I'm going to work through that. That's going to be a vehicle through which I'm going to change lives for eternity. This picture of takes them right up to Jesus Christ, who is the judge of the living and the dead. The things that we do here and the things that we do in declaring the good news of the gospel outside of here is of eternal consequence and, consequence. and Timothy is being charged to take the word to where it must go. It's kind of interesting when people um, will say little things in uh, the community. They'll say things like, uh, congratulations. And sometimes they don't even say what they're congratulating me for. And now I just say, thank you. Um, but they're saying congratulations on um, being made the senior pastor at Walnut Hill. And that just feels really weird to receive the word congratulations as if I achieve something. Um, but I've thought about it, and um, you could look at it another way in terms of it being an incredible honor. And there are a lot of honors to being a pastor in general and a ton of honors in being a senior pastor. I get to know things about you that other people don't know, and I get to speak words of encouragement and hope and comfort in times that you don't want to share maybe with other people, or at least not with a lot of people. But there's hardly an honor that's greater than be able to come before the people of God, open up God's word, read it, interpret it rightly, Lord willing, explain it, and exhort it. Well, this function uh, was one that a man named John Bunyan understood very well. Now, I'm going back a ways. John Bunyan was born in 1628. And uh, he was quite a man. He was from England, and he was uh, born to an English tinker, and that was kind of like a handyman. And he could do all sorts of things, and he took care of his own needs by uh, bivocational ministry. I mean, he, not even bivocational. He was, uh, he was a tinker. He, he served, but he also was called by God to preach. And he wasn't a part of the Church of England, which had become so corrupt that he had moved out of the church and, and began to join these, they call them nonconformists, the ones that would not, they felt like the Church of England had gone too far. And there were a lot of people that felt that. Some stayed within the church and felt that, and they were called Puritans. And the other ones that felt just the same as the Puritans, but said, no, it's gone too far, we have to leave. They, they call them nonconformists. And they eventually became Congregationalists in the U.S., especially, and, and Baptists uh, fell under that uh, title. But he, he joined this new movement and, and began preaching and, and, and just became enthralled as a Baptist with the Word of God. It was so wonderful to have the Word of God and, and to, to understand it. And, and then he was especially gifted by God to interpret it and, and explain it and, and exhort those words to people. And he did that faithfully. But then the monarchy was restored, and, and they had an act of, of 
um, what was it called? The Act of Conform no, the Act of Uniformity. Wow, wouldn't that be a nice act? Um, by the Church of England that said, nobody can preach if they're not in the Church of England. Again, more of the state church kind of stuff. Nobody can preach. So John Bunyan said, well, I don't want to get in trouble for preaching. Do you think he said that? No, he continued to preach. And eventually he was arrested. And they said, you've got three months imprisonment. That's your sentence. Three months. Um, and you have to agree to no longer preach anymore. And this was especially difficult for him and his little family. His wife had died. He had four children with her. His wife died. And then a year later, he remarried a young gal, and they were expecting their first child together. And while he was in jail, under the stress of the conditions, she had a stillbirth and was not able to. So she was left with these to care for his four children. And while that was taking place, John Bunyan, in prison, was about to be released. And they said that second condition, you will not continue to preach. And he said, I will continue to preach. And they said, well, then you will continue to be confined. And he was confined another 12 years. They consider it voluntary imprisonment because he would not agree to stop preaching. Now, he could have said, hey, folks, <laughs> this is kind of a tough time. You have your Bibles, and really just reading your Bibles can do the same thing. Get in the Word. We all have to do that. He saw there was a special function, in particular the one given to elders. Now, there is a general sense that we all are to declare the Word, but the function that he had of, of serving as a pastor and as a preacher was one that he knew. Paul told Timothy, read the Scriptures. But he also told him the Word needs to be preached. And John Bunyan continued to preach and to write, actually, in his cell. And, of course, he famously penned, penned what? Pilgrim's Progress. Yeah, one of the most famous uh, books ever written. Well, why did he endure all those years of imprisonment? Well, he knew God's words were meant to be declared. They were life-bringing words that were good and beneficial, and he knew that eternity was at stake. Let's close our time. Would you stand with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, I pray that we might stand by uh, your words, and we understand that these words aren't always going to be well-received in our day, and, and yet, Lord, you have given your people the opportunity to, to read. Oh, what a gift to have these words in our own language. How many believers have never, were never able to have the words in their own hands, in their own homes, and we have them, Lord. And I pray that we might stay close to them and, and that they might have a powerful effect upon our lives. But, Lord, I pray that we might be free to share them as well, to live by them, but to share them to stand firm, at times enduring difficult uh, passages, and yet fully trusting in you and that they have a life-giving power. We stand by your words. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.